check, check. Check, 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 check. Can you guys hear me all right? All right, all right. What a great tradition this is. Two years in a row. Hey, guys, I'm uh, Sam from uh, founder of Dogfish Head along with my wife Mariah over there. We're psyched for this event. Uh, second year in a row, we have uh, Dave Lemieux, a great friend now, part of our brewery. Give it up for Dave. Um, this is a great tradition. Uh, and uh, awesome that it's the second year in a row where you get greeted by a grilled cheese sandwich when you come in the door. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So I'm going to do the run of show, and then I'm going to invite David and our brewmaster, Mark Safrick, up. And we're all going to talk about our first uh, show that we ever got to go to. Uh, and then we're going to get into the night's uh, festivities. But it's going to be pretty awesome. Uh, there's uh, Chef Zach. He's going to be up here a little bit li later. Uh, all these guys have put a ton into this. Look at the room. I, I, give it up for all my coworkers who put so much love into every component of this night, from beer to food to atmosphere. David will talk a little bit later about the special playlist uh, that he put together. We got High Tide Sideshow upstairs. Pennsylvania's finest. Pennsylvania's finest. They'll be on in a bit. Uh, but uh, a little bit of a run of show. First, I want to say keep your raffle tickets all night long to turn them in because you're going to get a signed poster that uh, David signed on your way out with the hostess. But you do need your raffle ticket uh, to get that. The other thing I'll say is just kind of the flow of the night. You guys will each be getting four courses with drink pairings. And then High Tide Sideshow will be playing after uh, the dinner. So that's kind of flow of show. Other than Hazy Ripple, all of tonight's beers were made by one Brian Selders. Look at him over there. So handsome. So handsome. Next to Tom. Next to Tom, who has a massive day tomorrow. Big day tomorrow. Which you're excited about. So uh, every time that Chef Zach gets up, to talk about the beers other than Hazy Ripple. Brian's going to tell us about the awesome stuff that he's made. I'm really enjoying this uh, mid-90s red ale. It tastes like it was made in a microbrewery, not a craft brewery or a brew pub. In the, in the early 80s and 90s, there were no craft breweries. They're all microbreweries, and that's uh, perfectly timed for a micro-dosing uh, night. Uh, so with that, I want to invite David Lemieux and Mark Safrick up to, to introduce themselves and to talk about their first run-in with the world of the Grateful Dead. So you guys all know David's the archivist and legacy manager uh, for the Grateful Dead. Um, I, I know a bunch of you spent time next door with him at Chesham, Maine, which is super cool. But uh, uh, I'm a New England boy. I grew up in Western Mass. And uh, his first, I, won't, I, won't, I won't foreshadow his first show. I'm going to let each of them tell you memorable moments from their first uh, Dead show. So take it away, uh, David, and then we'll go. I think the live mics are the, are the non-wired non, uh, mic. So take mine, David, your first, and then Mark's next. Thank you, Sam. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. It is really a pleasure. I was saying earlier to Sam that I live it's pretty isolated where I live, and I don't venture off the island I live on very often. It's a, it's a lot of work, and this is a lot of fun. So this is uh, always worthwhile. So we'll do it again next year. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, first show. Uh, so we're all the same age, yeah. right? You're, roughly, yeah. yeah, roughly. A little younger. I wish. Oh. Uh, and Sam and I just found out we're the same age this year. Um, well, every year, I guess. Yes. Um, and we saw shows all around the same time. My first show was uh, 1987. And Sam was asking me about it earlier, and I was fortunate to have a really supportive mom who drove me to my first show. And it, was, it wasn't because she was all that into me going. It was because the alternative was having her 16-year-old take um, trains to New York City from Canada and then trains to Hartford and sleeping in the train station in order to see this band that he really liked. So I was fortunate to go see this, uh, this band that I was, I'd been listening to nothing but them for two years, as most of us did. And then we finally got to a show. It was probably the most magical night of our lives. So I remember I was, uh, if you can picture a hockey arena or basketball in, in your world, um, with the stage at one end, if you could be as far as you possibly can in the upper deck, the second last row of the Hartford Civic Center is where I saw it from. 
and I remember every second of it. Like, it, it I mean, I could tell you the set list. I could, as we all can, I think. We can remember all the shows we saw. So it was uh, really memorable. My mom, uh, I think she got to see it up close and was really supportive of the next show and then the next dozen and then the next 20 and the next 40 and the next 60 and then finally, mom, I'm not going to school anymore. I'm going to do this. Um, and she was okay with it. She knew it was a safe place to go. So she was a good mom. We're going to do a full-on Q&A later in the night, but a question that I have is through Dave's picks. Did you ever pick that show? Have you listened to that show uh, since, the first show you were at, and did you ever pick it to do something with it or any songs from it? Uh, no, we haven't released any. I listen to that show all the time. Uh, that's, I think of all the dead shows I listen to, uh, I, I think that show's probably the one. It's just got such memories for me. Um, it hasn't been picked yet, maybe someday. It is a great show, if you get a chance to listen. It's got probably three, four of my favorite versions of certain songs, and it's, uh, objectively speaking, I can honestly say they really are my favorite versions. So if somebody says, give me a bird song or a China Rider or a Black Peter from that era, without a doubt, these are the ones I give them, because they're really good. And again, that's the objective side of me, not the, which is a, a big challenge with the work, is the subjective and saying, oh, this is my favorite versus is the greatest. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Good one. Nice. And, and mine uh, was uh, just down the road from here when Mariah and I were in college. We were waiting tables here in Rehoboth as our summer jobs. I was, yeah, got you. Rehoboth! Woo! We're literally in Rehoboth. Where Mariah and I waited tables, I, I worked at the front page, which was a rock and roll bar one block over. God bless Terry Plowman. Uh, and and uh, everyone that ran that place. And the Mariah was one block uh, uh, towards the beach at uh, Camel's Hump, uh, uh, you know, which is a wonderful restaurant here in town. And we ditched uh, work one, one, one day, and we went to uh, RFK, and I think it was probably 91 or, or so. Was it? What do you think it was, 91? Yeah. Yep. So, and it was an awesome, awesome show, and I had grilled cheese in that parking lot and some other things in that parking lot. That I, I remember the grilled cheese. I'll say that. It was a very memorable day. And then Mark, who grew up in California, uh, the, the home of the Grateful Dead, tell your story on your first show. Is this on? Okay. Uh, so let's see. That would be uh, 1987 Laguna Seca Raceway, which was in, over in Monterey. And, uh, you know, we went to the show, and I had a friend of mine, his buddy, uh, or, his, or his grandma, rather, had a house in Carmel, California. So we stayed there. We didn't camp. And uh, that was my first experience with the, the whole dead scene. And I was like, wow, this is really incredible. And then the next day, we went to the next show. And everybody was like, Did you, were you here for the video shoot? We're like, video shoot? What are you talking about? And uh, they shot the Touch of Grey video that night. Uh, they basically pulled everybody from the camps, campground and uh, filmed it at the venue there during the evening. But uh, we were a little clueless at the time. But it was... Uh, it was an incredible show. I, uh, that was my first show, and after that, I went to everything I could. And being living in the Bay Area, that was possible to do quite a bit. I uh, got to go to when before they had to play huge stadiums, so that was all right. Um, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So now i got to look at my list to understand what's next in the night. But I do believe we're going to uh, next invite Zach and Brian up to talk about the first pairing of the night. You guys ready to do this? All right, let's do this. Let's do this. Thank you, Mark and David. Good evening, everybody. How are you today? It's been a beautiful, beautiful day. All right, so this is my good pal, Zach, and we worked very closely together um, on pairing great beers with uh, delicious, wonderful food. So Zach's going to talk about this dish that we're about to enjoy. Perfect. Um, first course, we have a little bit of roasted root veg salad. So red beets, parsnips, tricolor carrots, try to get some of that tie-dye in there as well. Um, hemp seed granola, one thing I think is underutilized. I'm a big fan of the hemp seed, it's great. Uh, covered in nugs vinaigrette. So I took some of the great beer. I'm sure some of you guys have tried covered in nugs. Turned that into a vinegar, made the nice vinaigrette with it. So the acid, the earthiness, 
from the granola and the root veg should pair pretty well together. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> Go Bills. Enjoy. Wait. Enjoy the the, uh, the salad, the beer is covered in nugs. This is the only repeat from last year's dinner. Covered in nugs is a classically dank American IPA made for, from uh, actually British uh, Golden Promise malt and um, the dankest hops we could find. And we took a lot of them and added them to the beer and then we added a lot more. So uh, please enjoy this beautiful pairing. Um, first of all, when I said our staff did an amazing job uh, with this, uh, the whole design of the space tonight, I love the homage to the wall of sound. Uh, isn't that nice? And uh, you know, so so that that you know, can you talk a little bit about the wall of sound and and how that was a differentiator for for the band? It was like uh, for breweries to invest in quality and consistency. Uh, was very meaningful for certain breweries. And I think that was a, an important thing for the band that really kind of helped their trajectory, right, get going. Can you talk about it? Uh, it, it was. The Wall of Sound, if uh, you don't know what it was, it was the dead sound system in 1974, and they used it for the whole year, and it essentially bankrupted them, if not financially, but pretty close to financially, but it, it essentially made them take a couple years off of touring because they had no money and they were exhausted from touring this, this sound system. But I don't know if you've ever made decisions that were the right decision for the art, for the brewing, but maybe financially they might have been a bit of a drain. The dead didn't care. At Dogfish, we call that being blissfully inefficient. And I would say the dead were certainly blissfully inefficient. And so they created the sound system that was, if you read newspaper reviews of dead shows in 1974, if you went to a show, it was without a doubt, it was the thing that people talked about. It was seeing the Grateful Dead play in this huge arena, in 18,000 seat arenas or stadiums, and the sound, whether you were right here or you were in the upper deck, sounded crystal clear but never distorted. And so the dead did this and they lost a ton of money and they had to keep touring in order to feed the monkey. They had a crew of 50 people. They had to leapfrog the stages and they'd be setting up in one city while they were playing somewhere. So it, essentially they got so exhausted from it, as did the crew. And then with being exhausted comes worse drugs that make you stay up at night. And so the dead took a couple years off from touring. And when they came back, no more wall of sound, rented equipment. It was a lot uh, smoother, but the sound certainly wasn't the same. So the wall of sound was financially a terrible decision. And uh, I think in every way it was a terrible decision, except artistically. And everybody will say, I heard an interesting story the other day at a, uh, at a wall of sound show in 1974. This guy had snuck in and he was sitting way at the back because he'd snuck in during sound check. And he looks sitting right beside him in the back of the building empty was Phil Lesh. And Phil had called his friend Jack Cassidy from the airplane from Hot Tuna. And he had Jack, who was probably, I think, one of Phil's favorite bass players, to be up on stage and play his bass alone, solo, with the wall of sound during sound check so that Phil could sit in the very back of this building, I think it was Winterland, and listen to what his bass sounded like and be in the audience for the wall of sound. And he said he's never heard anything like it. And I've heard, this, I've heard Phil tell the same story. I heard the story from a deadhead, and I heard Phil tell the same story that one time he had Jack play his bass while Phil sat way over there, and he said he, could, he couldn't believe how good it sounded. He said it was so worth the heartache and the financial ruin that it caused because it sounded so good. Best. Best definition of blissfully inefficient that I've ever heard. And did it, did it impact the, the quality of the taping? Like the era of, of Wall of Sound, was the taping any different than other eras? That really had more to do with the, uh, the recordist and Kid Candelario, one of the Dead's crew members, was recording the Wall of Sound shows. And they do sound fun. I love the Wall of Sound uh, recordings. They sound extremely crystal clear in terms of each instrument. You can hear everything coming clear. The vocals are a little thin. It's when they had, because the wall was behind them, you'd be getting feedback, right? So they had two microphones. One would cancel out the other. So you'd sing in, and it would cancel out the feedback coming through. So... Um, Vocals are a little thin, but otherwise they sound phenomenal. I love them. We have a, we have a new uh, Grateful Dead album coming out in uh, April, I guess, from the Wall of Sound from Miami. So from the, the High Lie, the High Lie front in 1974. Yep, yep, from the Wall of Sound era. So that's coming. It sounds amazing. Uh, some of my favorite stuff. Uh, sound and performance. 
So uh, Dave's in a minute going to talk about his inspiration for the playlist tonight. I asked uh, Mark to think about if he was making a road trip playlist, if he and Mary were going to do a long road trip to see a kid in Texas or even uh, Wilming Wilmington. <laughs> Uh, what what three dead songs would be on that? And I ask you to answer that any way you wanted. So that would be from shows I experienced? Any way you wanted, bro. Okay, sure. So, uh, what, and, and I think, so when, when, when David was out last year, I couldn't come to the, to the dinner. So uh, I texted Sam and said, please, please, please tell him to, uh, at some point in the future, put... The Morning Dew from Calaveras County Fairgrounds, 1988, I believe it was. Is 88. Calaveras. Calaveras. I don't know. I was there. <laughs> I, all the years, as they say, all the years combined. Uh, so anyway, that to me was probably the uh, quintessential Morning Dew, uh, sort of mid-80s Brent and Jerry uh, thing they used to do. Just It was amazing. They ended... Sunday with that. It was one of those ones that gave you the kind of shivers down your spine. I uh, still listen to that today. It's amazing. Um, any Jack Straw. And uh, just about any China writer, too. But, <laughs> but that morning, do you, you really need to put that on something. <laughs> okay. I'm going to just puss out and say the f first side... So what's the disco -y album we were talking? <laughs> so this is kind of pussing out, but the entire first side of Shakedown Street. I love, love, love that album. I know it gets maligned as kind of an outlier in the catalog. And it was really uh, refreshing f when we were, Dave and I were uh, doing something that our in earlier to hear his respect for the studio albums because so many hardcore dead fans lean you know, just into the live albums. Uh, maybe before we talk about the playlist, can you talk about your top three studio albums from uh, different eras? Uh, and it, we can combine the era of the uh, 15th anniversary of this year. So see, Sam had asked me what my favorite three dead studio records were, and I got a pass because two of them are so good I couldn't separate them. So that counts as one. Thank you for that. Um, and that's Working Man's Dead and American Beauty. Those are albums that I think... I think most of us, um, and I've, I've so many times gone back and forth with which I prefer, but I don't prefer either. I love them both. It's a double album, let's call it. And I love Terrapin Station. I've been a big fan since I was young. And then um, I think, and, and I do love the album, uh, Wake of the Flood, uh, partly because it's fantastic, but it's it just one of those albums that when I was 15 years old and bought it with my own money, it meant a lot to me. And I was, you know, you go through things when you're a teenager and music means a lot just as it does now. And I listened to that album a lot and really got into it. So yeah, those three. And then a few others. And then the live ones. And with that, we're going to ask David to talk about the inspiration for this playlist. What was, how did you curate this uh, playlist we're about to get into? So I was asked to put together some uh, previously unreleased music, which I love doing. It's always a challenge because we release, I think, some really good music with the um, Grateful Dead uh, archival stuff. But I put together things, um, I put together a few things that were quite different. I put together mostly larger jams, uh, sequences of, um, I think we heard a Samson, uh, Shakedown Samson, and we heard um, a really good uh, Scarlet Begonias in Dancing in the Street from 1978. Uh, we've got something coming up in a little bit from um, 1984, one of those good to help Slip Franklin's from 84. Uh, we're going to jump back to 73 in a bit. So I went to some bigger jam sequences that things that have been given serious consideration for release but have never been released and it doesn't mean they won't be released. I get asked that a lot as, are we ever going to release this show or that show? And the, the truth is we don't have a big master list of what the next five years of releases. We're working on something right now from 74 that comes out in a couple months. And then we've got the next one picked, the one that will come out in August. It's um, Dave's Picks 35. But aside from that, we have no idea beyond that. I mean, we've got some general ideas of great shows and things, but we just put so much work about six months into every release we do that it's really each one is its own thing. So we don't have this master list where we can just pick and choose from. We have ideas, where, and we know that someday we want to put out that show or that show, but when the time is right for it. But otherwise, we don't have this master list. So it was mostly selected based on things that I thought would work well with dinner. Um, when you say we, who, who's in the 
brain trust on the strategy of those forward coming releases? It's more the royal we. No, it's uh, it would be. Um, it, I've got uh, about four very good friends who are hardcore deadheads. They're our age. They're very objective and they're very honest. So um, if I'm really getting high on a show. And I, I, uh, one guy in particular, two, two or three in particular, four total, but one guy in particular, I'll say, hey, I'm giving serious consideration to this. He goes, here's, he'll, he'll, he knows the show, he knows this stuff, and he'll say, look, here's my problem with that show, and he'll lay out a big reason why, or a reason why it's a great idea, and we go from there. So I, it's ultimately on me, and I, it always starts with me. I don't kind of go to somebody with an idea and say, hey, you got any ideas? I'm a blank slate here. I usually have an idea of maybe four shows and start with that and then get some input from these kind of three or four main consultants. And otherwise, I listen to a lot of online chatter. Um, my friends are deadheads. It is. It's, you know, you, you guys send me an email. It, it actually matters. It's, uh, I, I don't do this job in a vacuum. So uh, I listen a lot and I, most of my friends are deadheads. We hang out, we listen to the dead and we'll be listening. We'll be doing a dinner like this, much smaller. And we'll be hearing something. We'll say, shit, this is a good one. We should put this out sometime. And that's often how the germ starts. And then, and then from there, you plant the seed. And then you spend the next few weeks listening to that show over and over. And then you get to the 30th listen, and you're still excited about it. And you're still finding new things. Or you're on the 30th listen, and you're like, eh, it's kind of boring me. So then you move on. Yep. Nice. Thank you, David. So uh, with that, I'm going to invite Zach and Brian up to talk about our second pairing. What did you guys think of the first pairing, that beet salad? And so many nugs, so many nugs, so little time. All right, hi everybody. It's us again. Hello, hello. This is Zach. All right, so the beer we're about to drink is um, a beer called the Final Date. Um, it, the, uh, the 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 name the Final Date is uh, it's named after this particular band's last show of their final um, European tour, which happened to uh, be in uh, Copenhagen, right? And so. Um, Sam had this idea where he wanted to brew a beer inspired by that, and he presented me with this really old text about Danish brewing history. And um, I scoured that for all the uh, details I could find to, uh, to come up with ingredients for this, uh, this fun beer. So in Denmark, that's where they first discovered, they first identified um, lager yeast and, I, and isolated it and started using pure, pure well, brewers yeast cultures, and so the, uh, the, the beer was fermented with that lager yeast. Um, the text made reference to um, floor malted Pilsner malt, and you know, since they're in Scandinavia, of course they used rye. Why wouldn't they? Um, what rye wouldn't they indeed? And then the, uh, the text also referenced Moravian hops, and Moravia is Germany, so we use some nice old uh, traditional German noble hops, the Hallertauer Middlefru and uh, Tetnang, um, in, ma in large quantities, and it's also dry hopped with that. So you'll find that the beer is nice and doughy. It's got a nice bready malt character with some spiciness from the rye. You'll get some pepper out of it. You'll get a nice uh, herbal character with hints of sage and thyme, and then it's nice and floral and earthy and uh, finishes crisp and delicious. And it's um, a beautiful pairing for this nice dish that Zach's about to tell you about. Um, second course, we have a spent grain house-made pasta. So I took some of the spent grain from the cover of the nugs he made last week, dried it out, milled it up, and then put it through our pasta extruder. It was my, one of my first times doing spent grain pasta. I'm kind of excited about it. I was happy the way it turned out. Um, so it's kind of my take on a carbonara, so a little bit of house-cured egg yolks. So we take egg yolks, equal parts salt and sugar, and we pack it in there, and we let it sit for about a week. It pulls out all the moisture, and it cures it. So it's kind of a way to get a little bit of Parmesan flavor in there, a little bit of salt, a little bit of sweetness in there. Um, house smoked shallots. So instead of using bacon, I figured this is a way to kind of get some of that smoky flavor into it. And then the wood-fired mushrooms. All our mushrooms, you can't really see the pizza oven. I'm sure some of you have been in here and eat one of our pizzas out of the pizza oven. All our mushrooms are cooked in those ovens. The temperature is super hot, five, six, seven hundred degrees. Just the flavor on it is phenomenal when they come straight out of there. Um, Sam wanted me to kind of chat about I'm a huge deadhead. deadhead. Um, I will have to blame my brother for that one kind of growing up. 
<laughs> my brother came all the way down from Buffalo for the dinner. And we can't forget about his wife. I like her more than him. <laughs> but growing up, kind of hearing all the jam band music, um, I was never a fan of it. You know how it is with your older brother. You don't really like to like him too much. So anything he liked, I liked the opposite. Um, but the more I got older, the more I matured, the more I learned. Um, I love the music. I love getting into it. There's nothing better than it. Um, it's a way for me to escape. You know, music and food are my two things. That's what I do day in and day out. Um, so it's awesome for me to kind of share my second passion with you guys as well. So enjoy. How are you enjoying the night so far? Are you guys having fun? All right. All right. So uh, on this property of 320 Rehoboth Ave, uh, there's been a massive amount of evolution and iterations that happen on this property. Tw 20, the first time we opened was in the open space between Chesapeake and Maine and here, and that's also the building that we, uh, with, with, with David Lemieux, uh, first did a batch of American Beauty. In that era, it was a different beer. Let's, gi let's give it up to that era. Uh, and it was a different recipe, and the recipe has evolved, as has the Grateful Dead, through the different generations of sound. And so now we're going to talk about, we finally have uh, Hazy Ripple in front of us, and I'm going to invite uh, Mark Safrick, who's been part of this journey of this recipe since the beginning with us uh, and really took the lead on uh, evolving the recipe to American Beauty uh, Hazy Ripple to talk about that recipe evolution. And then after Mark describes that, we're going to ask Zach uh, to talk about the dish that he prepared to pair with this beer. So, uh, you know, we've had, we've had, this is our third iteration of American Beauty, you know, and I remember when we first change the original, you know, 9% ABV a pale ale with granola. Love that beer. Um, but, you know, as, as with everything like the dead, you know, there were different eras, and we, you know, said, let's, you know, if we're going to do this, let's take it in a different direction. Um, we did lots of test brews. If you were down in our tasting room, you know, they, they, if you knew the code words, you knew what they were. So we might have had beers called One-Eyed Cheshire, or we might have had Diamond-Eyed Jack, or we might have had Cloud Hands. Uh, and if you know those lyrics, you know where those come from. Uh, but, you know, with this one, uh, we wanted to sort of bring that sort of IPA style into that class, the, the, the newer sort of experimental uh, in, into a hazy style. Uh, so, and that's what we did with this one. Uh, and looking at sort of what's a unique way to step into that space. And so we looked at spelt as, as a, a means of driving that haziness and also bringing a sort of spicy earthiness to the beer as well. And then really taking it in a, in a, a, a sort of totally different direction and, and uh, making it much more tropical and hop-centric and a little less malty. Uh, and so this beer is, it's got lots of notes of pineapple. It's got a, a, a very sort of eclectic hop bill, uh, both citrusy and spicy. So there's notes of mandarin, pineapple, and things like that in it. And uh, I don't really know much, how much more to say about that. I'll just start rambling and saying, where do I put Available. my hands? Oops. <laughs> Available everywhere in canned six-packs with iconic dancing beer artwork. Go find it. <laughs> well said, Mark. And now, to lead us into the decision on what to pair with this beer is Chef Zach. So just uh, walking off stage last time, Mariah actually corrected me. So I do have three loves. I have music. I have food, and I have the damn Buffalo Bills. <laughs> Thank you, Mariah, for reminding me. And Trisha. So let's go, Buffalo. Um, so, so lastly, uh, this last course with the Hazy Ripple, kind of touching on the citrusy, the pineapple notes, um, jackfruit. Or no, it's in the mulberry family, in the fig family. So this big, old, huge fruit, uh, real rough on the outside cutting it open, picking the seeds out of it. It has a lot of sweetness to it. It has a little bit of acid to it. So I thought it would pair really well with this beer. A little bit of potato puree, um, quickly shaved down Brussels sprouts, braised with a little bit of apple cider vinegar. And then I made a vegetable demi, which I was trying to think, how can I get something that's rich, flavorful, super thick? So I cooked down a bunch of mushroom stems from the last course, 
cooked that with a little bit of uh, tomato puree in it and really just cooked it all the way down with some reduced red wine and then I mounted it with a little bit of uh, veggie butter. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you. All right, cool. So, all right. Um, about two months ago, we had the distinct honor to, of um, surprising uh, a longtime dogfish fanatic. And um, we went to his place of work, RNL Liquors in Lewis, Delaware. And we said, we, we, we all jumped in there on the Facebook Lives and we said, Yo, Tom, we love you. We love that you love us. We love that we love each other. Let's make a beer together, my friend, to celebrate you and you being the most wonderful dogfish evangelist anybody could ever imagine. So we said, Tom, if we can make any one beer, what ingredients would you put into that beer? And the first word out of Tom's mouth was sprinkles. <laughs> and we went from there. So that fine gentleman is gracious with his presence tonight. That is Tom Greenwood right over there. If you don't know Tom, um, then you don't know the most selfless and caring and generous man who has existed that I know of. Um, maybe there's others, but I doubt it. Maybe they come close. Anyway, so we worked together to make this beer with the sprinkles. And uh, he wanted to make a dark beer. He wanted to make a milk stout. And he wanted to also add bananas and peanut butter and marshmallows. And, and I said, all right, we're going to make it happen. And so um, here we have the beer, Mr. Chuckles, which is named after his clown persona, Mr. Chuckles. And uh, so, so many layers to this, right? This is... <laughs> so, so let's raise our glass of Mr. Chuckles to Mr. Chuckles himself. Cheers, Tom. Enjoy. Thank you for everything, my friend. This beer will be released in a very, very limited bottle run of 140 bottles tomorrow. Um, the sale starts at 11 a.m., Limit one bottle per person. We'll see you there. Tom's making balloon hats. Zach, take it away, my friend. Guys, hopefully, I hope you guys enjoyed this so far. I just want to take a quick second and give it up. Um, all the back of the house over here, these are the guys, the heart and soul of the kitchen. And not to forget our lovely front of the house. Let's give it together for them too, please. <laughs> Justine, turn around. Justine. So <laughs> a little bit about Justine. We started talking about this dinner and decorations and what should we do. Um, she pulled her hair out for the last five days dealing with me. I was like, well, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should add a little bit more. So all the decoration, all of it. Justine handled all that with some help. Give it up to her, too. All right, last but not least, dessert will be coming out in a second. We are doing a little goo balls, not the ones you used to get on lot, unfortunately. Um, but super lemon haze, terpenes inside of it, Fruit Loops, Fruity Pebbles, and Lucky Charm Marshmallows. Thank you, guys. It's been a blast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Have a great night. I almost forgot, sorry. The glass is for you guys to take home. There is a rinsing station over here. If you guys want to rinse your glass out with a little paper bag for you to put your glass in. Thank you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you guys are, uh, desserts coming around, enjoy those balls. Uh, but we are gonna do some super fun Q&A. Some questions can come from y'all towards David for dead-related awesomeness towards Mark and myself for dogfish-related awesomeness. 
Um, and we also put out the bat signal to Dogfish Heads and the Grateful Dead social media universe. So some questions will come from that as well, right, Janelle? Okay, Janelle, let's do this. You're running the show from now on. Go. Here's one that is truly from a deadhead. How many 50th anniversary issues are we getting this year, David? And I actually did say your name. Oh, yeah. Well, um, uh, two, uh, likely two. Um, with the two big 50th anniversaries in the dead world, we have uh, Working Man's Dead in June and American Beauty in November, so I wouldn't be surprised if there were a couple plus the beer, so make that three. And was, I think there's going to be a lot of celebration throughout the year. I have a quick question. Sophia, can I get one of these glasses? <laughs> really? Thank you. All right, live questions. Has anybody had time to formulate one? This may also be for Tom. If you were to make a dancing bear beer, what would be your influence? I don't know, you could go the Owsley route for bear. Um, I don't know, I'd go, I, I, I love everything you guys have done. I like the first recipe with the granola. I'd head back in that direction, I think. Yep. Was, I, I, love, I love the one we had tonight. I would like to know if you could choose any song by the Grateful Dead, which one would you choose and what kind of beer would you make to go along? I know. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I do like a dark beer, uh, and so I would do uh, something sort of inspired by Dark Star, and it would be um, have a lot of sort of nuance to it, and uh, I would have to, to ruminate on that through many listenings of Dark Star to come up with a specific formula because, you know, contrary to popular belief we don't just generate these <laughs> in there um but that that would be what what i would would do uh something very innovative and uh exploratory as as dark star is so and mine would be um as i mentioned earlier um the 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 disco album that i i love disco dead album <laughs> had a song called shakedown street on it so good i think and uh, I would brew a beer called Todd McNamara, and it would have all the shake left from all the bong Yahtzee games we ever played. All the leaves, the little tiny dusty leaves of marijuana, and I would call that beer Todd McNamara. Gonna toss out another one from the interwebs. David, why hasn't there been any 90s shows chosen for the Dave's Picks series? Racist. <laughs> Racist. Uh, that's a good question. Um, there's no particular reason. We've got a few 90s shows out in other formats. We put out uh, a couple of box sets that, from 1990. That was uh, 14 shows. And then we last year did a um, box set with a couple 91 shows. Uh, we've done some videos from 91, 90, um, so we, we do get them out just in different formats for, I think, why no Dave's Picks? Because they do come out in other formats, often box sets or videos. So we kind of, something like 1977, we're not going to necessarily put in a box set, so that's why. How's it going, Sam and Dave? I got a couple questions for you. Are all the tapes in the vault digitized? And if they are, do you have access to like a Grateful Dead archival database to choose from? No, they're not all digitized. Um, a lot of them are, but we do have low resolution kind of, we call them reference tapes, which is more like a reference uh, digital audio tape that Dick might have made in the late 90s. I made a lot of them in the early 2000s. And we more methodically go through things if we're working on a project from 1977, let's say. We just did a show from uh, October 29th. And there's a few other shows around that time that hadn't been digitized. So we'll call up all maybe six or eight shows and digitize that whole batch in chunks. So we do things like that. It's, um, there's a lot of reasons why we haven't done it. A lot of it has to do with uh, format obsolescence. That if we spent the 
I don't know, half a million, million dollars, whatever it was to digitize the entire collection to 2020's standards, in seven or eight years, we'd have to do it again because probably something better would come along and you can't just migrate the 2020 digitized back and do it back up in seven years. So we're kind of waiting on the perfect format. It hasn't arrived yet. So we do it in, in segments. Awesome. I, I also did have a second part to the question. Um, have you ever thought about publishing a book about your listening notes? Um, you must have a ton of them. I have a lot of notes. Um, I write everything down. I don't know, would it be that interesting to you? Uh, I mean, yes. Oh. It would be interesting pretty much to everybody in this room. <laughs> I'd think about it then. Okay, well, thank you. I'd never thought of it. Um, yeah. These are, you know, I, while I listen, I'm constantly, well, you guys, you know, you make things and you write notes down, right? And it's the same thing. I, I make notes of what I, I do for work. And every show I listen to, a bad one, a good one, I make notes. And, uh, okay, I'll put some thought into that. That's so great, man. I'd love to read that up. book. Okay. And one last, que one last question is from the great Charlie Miller. Uh, why haven't you released 331-1980? I guess the same reason we haven't released 1,500 other shows. It just hasn't had its time yet. It doesn't mean it's a bad show. It's a great show. Right. It really is. But, yep, it's, so there's, there's, well, there's 1,500 shows that haven't been released. I think the dead have released two or 300 shows on CD. So there's still 1,500 left in the vault that we haven't released. So their time will come. Great. I'm not saying, I, and we've got no timeline, we've got no master list of what's coming next, but, I mean, we've been doing it for 25 years, and uh, 25 more, we'll get a bunch more out. Great, thank you so much. I just want to say, Sam and Mariah, thank you for hosting this special night. I've been a dogfish head Especially since Mariah. the uh, shelter paleo days. We're going to bring that up. shit back. We're, Brian Sellers is bringing that shit back. While, while uh, Janelle's getting ready to ask another question, I've got one for David myself, which is, what other band or musician do you think's done a great job of curating their back catalog in a way that keeps their music vibrant and alive, and why? Fish. Um, uh, it's a tough question. Um, a lot of bands just simply didn't record the way the Dead do, and the Dead recorded, thankfully, uh, 1,800 of their 2,300 shows whereas most bands haven't done that. Um, I think Wilco is doing a very good job of it. Pearl Jam did a great job. Pearl Jam recorded and released most of their shows. Um, they've slowed down on that. Um, but a band like David, well, a guy like David Bowie recorded two or three tours in order, uh, two or maybe three shows on a specific tour to get a live album out of it, and that's it. Bowie's archive is less than 25 live shows, and they're generally from the same kind of four or five eras from the live albums, David Live and Stage and things like that. So a lot of bands just simply didn't do it. U2 doesn't do it. Um, I mean, they, they do reference tapes, but they're not doing high-resolution things that you could release someday. So it's unfortunate. I, I think bands should record everything. And some bands do, but most bands don't, unfortunately. That's a moment for me to give props to Dave, who runs sound here, who, who actually does take the time to digitally record everything we produce in this room. Props, Dave. Janelle, you got something? Yes. <laughs> so good, so good, Jamie, so good. If I could ask the guys on the stage, favorite show? If you could pick one, what would you suggest to the folks in the crowd to pick up and listen to? Mine's the shortest because Mariah and, only, I, and I only went to two. And it was the one in Washington, D.C., um, where we played with the sticks and we had the uh, grilled cheeses and we tried things that aren't legal. That's my answer. I had no, I have no, had no sticks that I played with, but uh, I, I would say the one, and I referenced it earlier, the 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 Sunday set Sunday at Calaveras, uh, first set you had Santana come out and play Ico and Watchtower, uh, which was smoking, and uh, it's got a great Scarlet on it, it's uh, Scarlet Fire, and uh, uh, the, the the it's got uh, uh, Dear Mr. Fantasy on it with Brent, just awesome. 
And uh, then they they finish the show out with Morning Dew that I referenced earlier, which you should totally put on a record, just saying. Uh, and uh, it was amazing. They had uh, uh, David, Lin uh, David Lindley and El Rio X open for them, then they had Santana, and then you had The Dead, and they had uh, airplane biplanes, acrobatic biplanes, like dive bombing the show. It was amazing. And parachutists. It was amazing. At least I think those things were there. I mean, that's... <laughs> I might have been imagining that, but I'm pretty sure those were there, and it was an amazing show. <laughs> I wish I was at that show now. Uh, what was the question? Be uh, the best show I saw? Best memorable show you were there for. Best show, oh, he's saying best show ever. I don't know, I'm not, that's a little subjective, but I'm going to say best show I was at. I mean, no, my favorite show I was at, I'm not going to say best was up in uh, Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh. Um, it's a good show. Uh, April 2nd, 89. Uh, blew me away. First Shakedown Street. First live Shakedown I saw. Uh, a show that I can't get enough of is Harper College, which is uh, May 2nd, 1970. It's a show that I could listen to every day of my life. And uh, it was one of the show that I, one of the first things I got when I was 14 years old. And now 40, uh, 35 years later, I'm still listening to it. And I just can't get enough of it. So, and there's, there's a lot of those, but that's one of them for sure. Hey, uh, Dave, uh, question. Um, the Betty Boards, right? We're, I think we're all very thankful that they came back to the vault and we appreciate the release of those, those shows. Um, was the band... Did the band know they came back to the vault? Were they interested that those particular tapes and, and that find was back in the vault? And uh, what was the interaction and what was the feeling when those things came back? Well, so uh, the question's about some tapes, uh, quite a few tapes, about 400 reels, uh, reel to reel tapes uh, from about 1971 to 79. Some of the best shows the Dead ever played from some of the best eras they ever played. And these tapes had been missing from the Dead's vault for uh, decades, going back to, well, when they were recorded, really. And about three years ago, all of these tapes came back to the Dead's vault. So the feeling was complete jubilation on my part. I mean, we've always worked with this finite number of tapes that, in my estimation, we could go for 20 more years, 25 more years at the quality we're doing things and keep releasing things. What this done is it's, I think, extended the life of what we can do. So uh, it shows like Cornell University in, in 1977 and the new June 76 box set. Yeah, great show. Uh, we just released a box set from June 1976 that's also from these tapes. And so a lot of tapes have come back. There were tapes that we could never do anything with because we just simply didn't have them. So there were shows that I've, I mean, I've always loved them from my tape trading days, but couldn't release them. Now we can. So we've got a lot more years of really high quality dead to come out thanks to these tapes coming home. Follow-up question is when you say they were lost and then they came back, how did they come back? Like in what format and from whom? Uh, the format was the master, the master tapes. Um, the tapes 19, uh, in the 70s, they went into, or 80s, they went into a storage locker and the bill wasn't paid on them. It was simple as that. They went up for auction. Some deadheads bought the tapes and held on to them until 2017. And then they, I think they realized, and we realized, these tapes aren't doing anybody any good under somebody's bed. And this way they came home. And so the, it was a magic, it was a Saturday when they came back. A truckload of tapes showed up at the vault. It was very exciting. It was a good day. So I apologize, my question is definitely for Sam. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Ancient Ale series. Are you yeah. ever going to do more of those? Right. Bring those back? Right. So, uh, uh, first of all, weird that you're apologizing for asking me a question, but I, I get it. That's cool. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you were here. I'm glad you love those beers, too. And uh, the, the short answer is history is relative. What's ancient is relative. And we still have Midas Touch every day of the, of the year that we make, which was our OG experiment with ancient ales. But the challenge with ancient ales is the ingredients in them from around the world are so esoteric and expensive to get here that we have to charge a lot for them. And it became a challenge to release those. That said, as I said, what's ancient is relative. And, uh, you know, we're now relatively ancient as a 25-year-old 
craft brewery in an industry that's only 35 years old. And so in this build, on this property, Brian Selders is charged with resurrecting ghosts uh, every year. And there's going to be some really, really cool releases of uh, beers that are from our 25-year history that we get a lot of chatter about, Janelle and Mariah, uh, online saying, hey, bring back Shelter, bring back Chicory, bring back Raison, bring back Theobroma. Uh, so yes, I believe there'll be resurrections of ancient ales and past favorites from Dogfish, and that will mostly happen from the Rehoboth campus, more so uh, than Milton, so stay tuned for that. So this one is part question, part opinion, and all three of you are allowed to answer this. Um, we've talked about best show, we talked about best album. What would you consider the best year for the band? And this is the opinion part. This, Robert says, I love anything from 1977 because it turns out when you rehearse, you sound pretty good. And the Hampton shows from March of 88 were just amazing. I would agree with those that um, rehearsal is good and the dead famously did not rehearse ever. Um, the only time they did was 77, a little bit. And when they had new songs, when Jerry or Bob would bring new songs to the band in the 80s, 90s, they'd rehearse a little bit, like a day or two to learn those songs. But they certainly weren't rehearsing before a tour. So oftentimes the dead wouldn't necessarily, they wouldn't see each other for you know three or four weeks, a month or two. And they'd see each other on the road at the, at the plane when they'd go to the next city for the first show of the tour. So they weren't rehearsing, but when they do, they played extremely well for a little while. Um, Hampton 88, also, they are very good shows. So yes, I agree with that opinion. Um, yeah, Hampton 89, great shows too. Um, I, I really, I don't have a best year, a favorite year. I honestly don't have a favorite year. I think that's what keeps, I've been doing this for a long time, and I want to do it for a long time more. And part of it is that I, I really get off on every year of Grateful Dead. And if, if we're looking at something from, you know, 68 or 73, these are all years I love. 84, 92, 93, some of the maybe lesser loved years. And I find phenomenal music in there. And you have to dig a little deeper. And that's what I love about the music is that I do dig really deep to find that one show from 93, from 94, from 95, from 84, 83. And there's a lot of good stuff. You got to dig a little harder. Whereas 87... It's a little easier to find the good stuff because every night was good because they were rehearsing because they were playing so much. Um, they were so focused on what they were doing. So um, I honestly, my honest answer is I don't have a favorite year. If it's what we're working on, I love, I can find something. I don't, I don't love everything. There's a lot of Grateful Dead music I, I don't, that's not as good as other stuff. But when, it, when we're finding something from any era, I can find music that gets me just as high as some of the, the classic years of 77, 73. So I don't have that. Got anything? A year? A year? A year of favor? Oh. Let me kick that for a minute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I would agree with you. 87 for me personally, and also I think as I li listened to tapes was... Uh, Sorry, let me do that. I, I'm not familiar with being on stage. Uh, th th those were... Um, that was a year that for me personally and also I think what the dead was playing at the time was really good I think 72 73 that era was also super tight even if they weren't or, uh, rehearsing or anything um, but I can find gems I think just listening to individual shows throughout the years I mean you might find a show that you you're not too particularly you know happy with for whatever reason but I always seem to find a gem in at least one show you know, regardless of the era. So. I'm, I'm not going to reference the year, I, I guess not 1970, because it brought Dogfish Head and, uh, and the Grateful Dead together, because that was the year of the album that we're celebrating. Um, it's our year. Uh, uh, but I am going to ask a question uh, to, to David, which is when you said, you know, there was a year of rehearsals more than ever, when uh, Jerry and, uh, was it Phil that was mostly doing the writing with Jerry or Bob? Uh, they were on their own. Yeah. Jerry and uh, Hunter. Yeah. So Hunter was doing the lyrics, yeah. right? And Jerry the music or yep. Arlo yep. and, and Bob. 
And so what years do you think were lyrically, everyone talks about the music of the Grateful Dead, but when you think of the lyrics of the Grateful Dead, what era do you think represents the Grateful Dead's message lyrically, not musically, the best? You know, it's hard not to think of Working Man's Dead and American Beauty when, I, when you ask that question. But then I can listen to some of Jerry and Hunter's songs from 92 and 93, So Many Roads, um, Liberty, songs like Days Between. And these songs are just as classic as 1970, Grateful Dead, Ripple, Broke Down Palace, Truckin', all those songs. So it's a tough one. I think their songwriting, and we were in Barlow too. If you listen to their, let's say, 72 output of, of uh, Mexicali Blues and Black Throated Wind and Cassidy, and then you jump ahead many years to Throwing Stones uh, a decade later, 12, 19, uh, 1982. So you listen to some of that stuff, and it's, I think, just as strong. So they had incredibly strong songwriting partnerships. The good music through all eras. That's what I love about the dead. David, will you entertain a, a couple of dead and company questions? What? Yes, sure, sure. I have two questions. First of all, uh, do you foresee a dead and company album, studio album coming out anytime? You know, I, what was the last tour they did? They did a fall tour, right? Um, yeah, fun run. yeah I, I, so I don't, there's no new music, so I don't know. Um, they sure are playing well, and they like being together. So maybe if there's new music to play, if uh, I mean they haven't really been playing anything new, so I don't know. I'd love to see them. I mean, do reinterpretations of Grateful Dead stuff, and see if they could do something like that in the studio because I think they could sound really good in the studio. But I haven't heard anything, and I'd love to see it though. And one other Dead and Company related question: uh, I know Bob had a dream or a vision that. Years later, he was kind of looking over and saw John Mayer with gray hair and O'Teal with gray hair. Do you think that is the, the hope that they become a band even after the Mickey and Billy and Bob are gone, that Dead and Company will live on? I think they will, and the reason I say that is because most of the good players who have played with these guys in the last 20 years, 20, 25 years since Jerry died, are still playing Grateful Dead stuff. And you think of John Cattlesick, and a phenomenal player, and he's still doing Grateful Dead stuff. And he, he came from a Grateful Dead background, and then he played with Bob and Phil. He was in Bob and Phil's band. He was the guitar player in Further. And then he left that band when, when Dead and Company started, and he's still doing incredible stuff. And I think he'll do it. He's my age, maybe less, maybe younger. And so he's going to keep doing it for many, many years. Um, so I hope so. I, I, I don't see why they wouldn't. I mean, John and O'Teal and Jeff clearly love playing this music. So they can also do other things. And that, I think that's fascinating to watch John do what he's doing, where he tours with Dead & Company once or twice a year, and yet he still does an album on his own and tours arenas, huge success on his own, and then does it. So I don't see why he couldn't do both. I'd like to think he would. He certainly loves it. I've talked to him enough to know that he... Is, it's in his heart now. It really is. This is not just a gig for him. It's, it's, uh, it's part of his life. Thank you. And, and when you talk about John getting ready for his run with uh, Dead & Co. and you chatting with him, did he ask you for archival stuff to prepare him for that journey? And Can you talk about that for a minute? Uh, absolutely. John, um, I think more than anybody I've seen work with these guys, has worked extremely hard. To, he knows the importance of it is partly it. He's a true professional, but... He's worked really hard to be um, as good as he can be at this. And he comes in with this incredible talent, incredible skill, but no Grateful Dead background, really. So when they started rehearsing in the fall of uh, 2015, the band was giving him 10 songs a day to learn and saying, okay, learn these 10. And then he'd come to me and ask me for uh, the studio version and a live version and maybe an under-the-radar live version or if there was a different arrangement of something. So we were working together quite collaborative the first year or so, getting him music so that he could learn it before the rehearsals. And they've rehearsed a lot. They, they spend a lot of time rehearsing. And you hear it. They're playing really well. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Does anybody have a live one? This is, this is for David. It's sort of a nerdy tech, tech question. You mentioned the 
tapes coming out of the vaults that have been in there since the 70s. And I had always heard that magnetic tape didn't always hold up so well, and there could be some problems with 40-year-old tapes. I was curious about the quality of what came out, whether you had to do anything with them. Uh, well, we do a lot. Uh, not so much. Um, but uh, knock wood, but we've now been working with tapes that are 55 years, 54 years old, 50 years old. Uh, the new release coming out soon is 46 years old. And knock wood, we've not yet come to one single analog master tape that's had a problem. We've never had to say, oh, this tape has finally given its all for rock and roll. We've never had to go to the high resolution backup or the low res backup or something else. We've never had that problem yet. It will happen someday. These things don't last for 500 years, but they're 50 years into it, and so far they're holding up extremely well. And we, we expect it, and so when we put a tape on, we expect it to play well, but someday it's going to come on and it, it's not. And I think that might light the fire to make us do the higher resolution digital stuff, but so far it's holding up extremely. Every time we put a tape on, we expect it to be good, and it is. It's exciting. I mean, these tapes are the ones that were in the building with the band. You got the band was in there, this tape was in there, and that's it. So it's pretty cool. Who wants the last question? I see a hand. So how about Charlie Miller? <laughs> He's a busy guy. He's a guy who um, he takes... Uh, Grateful Dead uh, tapes from that are in circulation and cleans them up and then puts them out there in probably the best they've been uh, if they're unreleased music. So the guy's doing, he's busy. I mean, I've, he's putting up a lot of music. I don't know where he finds the time because he's also got gigs. He's also working with Kim Ock and people like that. So busy guy. Totally. I think that's all we got for questions. Um, hopefully you guys held on to those blue tickets. Because it's time. What, what are we doing? Are we not oxygen? Are we ox what are we doing? You're going to pick a winner. Oh, we're going to pick some winners. Sophia. And by the way, give it up for Sophia, who did so much to organize tonight. So, David, we saved this album from last year. It's the July 1966. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? You signed this last year, very, very long ago. But we have it to give away tonight. This is, uh, this is an album that apparently I signed a year ago. It's an archival signature. And it's a Canadian album from right near where I live. Um, it is in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, one of the first times the dead ever left California. And they came up to Vancouver, played this incredible little hall at the Pacific National Exhibition in Vancouver, uh, the PNE Garden. If you want to see a cool auditorium, it's the PNE Garden Auditorium in Vancouver. And this is some of the earliest Grateful Dead we've ever released. And it's really fun stuff, uh, recorded by none other than Owsley Stanley, Bear. Um, a really wonderful album. I really like this one. And this was, uh, I think it was a Record Store Day exclusive. So you won't get this anywhere but, are, are you giving this away? You won't get this anywhere but right here. And just this last, uh, this is the last copy. This is way sold out. Mark Safrick's going to pull the winning ticket. And just a reminder, keep your blue ticket. Uh, when you're leaving, give it to the hostess, and they'll give you your uh, signed by David Lemieux uh, poster for this evening. Keep the blue ticket. Don't try the brown acid. <laughs> all right. All right. So the, the winning number is 807. Five three three. Hi oh come on, who's that? Raise your hand, come on. Hi oh there he is. All right. <laughs> and so with that as a reminder guys, uh, keep your raffle ticket again. As you leave, you're gonna get a signed poster. And with that High Tide Sideshows coming up in a minute. I hope you guys have had a blast tonight. I know we have. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chef. Thank you, David Lemieux. Thank you, Mark Safrick. Thank you, fans of the Grateful Dead and, and of Dogfish Head. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>